get this Gordian knot out of here real quick. All right, we're going to talk about this tonight, and I hope it's a blessing to you. Are we turned on? And we're ready to go? This has been an interesting uh, week so far, because usually I'll preach in English, and then I'll do a sermon in Spanish every week. And as you know, I put a new sermon up every week in English and Spanish on thecloudchurch.org. And uh, usually, sometimes I'm outside, sometimes I'm in front of the whiteboard at the house, but I always do English first, and then I do the Spanish after. Well, this sermon is a sermon that I did several years ago in Mexico, and uh, I never recorded it. So I did it today at home in Spanish, and I thought I'd do it tonight in English, and we'll post this to the Cloud Church as the Sermon of the Week, and that'll really help me this week not have to do an extra sermon. So that's working out great. So already done in Spanish. I hope I don't think in Spanish. All right. Do this real quick if I start speaking in Spanish, because I've already have the mindset of I've already done this in Spanish. So please, if a, if a Spanish word slips out and you don't know what I'm saying, please raise your hand and go, what'd you say? Sometimes if you speak another language, sometimes you just go off in another language speaking. And I just pray to God I don't do that tonight. Amen. All right. So let's get started tonight. Tonight we're going to talk about the false gods of today, the false gods of today. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, and we're going to start in verse 1. We're going to look at the false gods of today. Now, originally this message, like I said, was preached in Spanish in Mexico. And I called it the false gods of Mexico. And I wanted to call this the false gods of America. Because in America, we see these false gods today. But, um, you know, this is going all over through the internet and everything. So I just said, well, let's call it the false gods of today. So it goes around the whole world because the whole world today has departed from God. Do you believe that? Yes. It's sad that many today have turned away from God. But it's nothing new. In the Bible, we see people doing that a lot. And you know what? It never turns out good for them, does it? When they get away from God, then the suffering comes, then the problems, then the plagues, then the, everything bad that can happen happens when you get away from God. So it's good to get with God and be on the same page as Him instead of turning away from Him as many do today, unfortunately. Exodus chapter 32. Here's the children of Israel. Exodus chapter 32. And just verse 1 is sad enough. I mean, it's all right there in verse 1. And I just read verse 1 and I have to stop and go, what? Before I read the rest of the chapter. How could this happen? It makes me angry sometimes when I read the Bible and see what the people do in the Bible. It makes me want to reach into the page and grab them and just shake them and go, why did you do that? Yeah. <laughs> do you ever want to do that sometimes? Amen. But why is it recorded? It's here recorded for us so it shows us, hey, you don't do that. Okay? So it's in the Bible to show us that's what they did. Now you don't do that. Okay? Exodus chapter 32, well, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, now this is the Exodus, they have left Egypt. All these miracles that they saw and God protecting them and, and rescuing them from 400, close to 400, maybe a little more than 400 years in bondage. You would think these people would be on a spiritual high and so close to God and so happy. But Moses goes up on the mountain and he stays gone for a long time. And look at what these people do. The people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we what not, what means no, we what not, what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, No, that's sin, don't think that, don't do that. Is that what he said? Watch what he says. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. He goes along with it. Why is he doing that? I mean, by night, there's what? A pillar of fire. The day, there's a cloud. If they want, they can just look and see God. They should be that close to God. And yet they go, Let's go find some other gods. Okay. And the man of God, in place of Moses, Aaron at the time goes, Well, all right. What kind of person does that? Why did Aaron do that? And all the people break off, uh, break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. You know that's a lie from the pits of hell? Yeah. 
The false gods were the ones in Egypt. The true God is the one that took them out. Why did all of a sudden they want to go back to worshiping those gods instead of the one true God? Didn't they see a miracle with the parting of the Red Sea? I mean, I'd be following that God. Why did they go back to the other gods? Isn't that sad? Do you see that as well? Now look what it says here in verse 5. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is the feast of the Lord. Ho! Oh, let's mix paganism and idol worship with the things of God because this is one of our feasts. Do you see what they did? They mixed with paganism. Oh, they're not doing that today, are they? Yeah, yeah they are, unfortunately. And it says, And they rose up early in the morrow, verse 6, and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. You know what they did? They fornicated. You find that in other passages of the scriptures. They went out and they started fornicating. Because that's what the pagans did when they worshipped their idols. They would fornicate. They would do even worse. They would do sexual sins. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down for thy people, which thou, look what God says, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted your people, Moses. I thought they were God's people. Well, God was not very pleased with what they were doing, was he? No. Isn't that interesting? They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now I could continue reading there, but I'll stop. But look what it says there. These be thy gods, O Israel. Verse 8. God was a little bit angry, don't you think, when he said this? Yeah. Today we have people that want different gods instead of the true God. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to go through and just show you, these came out of my own head, if you will, just some things that I thought about that people make into their own God that they worship rather than the true God. And it's sad. And you know, there might be someone in here with us today. This might be one of your gods. What do you need to do? You need to get rid of it. You need to say, Lord, I don't want to worship that instead of you. Lord, I want to get closer to you. Amen. Today we see a great parallel to Israel and what took place back then, taking place today in the world. Israel had the true God, yet they chose to follow false gods rather than the one true God. Look at America. We used to be a Christian nation. Remember the Pledge of Allegiance? You'd stand up there and you'd say, I pledge allegiance to the flag. One nation under who? God. They want to take that out. They have coins that say, in God we trust. Have you seen the new quarter, the new uh, Washington quarter? Washington was always looking to the right on all the quarters and currency. Was he saying, yeah, I'm a conservative, the conservative is the right wing? They've changed the new currency to where he's looking to the left. And in God we trust is over here. It's like they're saying, we turned our back on God. And Washington's looking the opposite direction of trusting in God. Have you seen that new quarter? Is that on purpose or is that just an accident? No. Well, you got to wonder. It might be on purpose. So many today have false gods and they turn from the true God and they're looking at these false gods and they're worshiping these false gods. What are they, you say? Well, let's go ahead and start off. I'm going to have fun today, hopefully. The first one I want to say that's a false god of many today. Let's just call it silver and gold. Now, what I mean by that, because we don't use silver and gold nowadays, unfortunately. 1933, they outlawed gold, and uh, finally Reagan let us have gold again. And silver, 1964 is the last year that our currency was silver, unfortunately. But there are people out there today, they love money. <laughs> See, I did it in Spanish. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Grab me one of these Kleenexes. I got it. Uh, See, I told you I'd start in Spanish here. Sorry. Money starts with an M. Money. There are people out there. Their God is money. Amen? Do you see that? There are people out there. I don't care about God. I just want to get some money. And if I could just be rich, man, I'd have it made. Is that what life is about, getting rich? No. Well, it's good to have a job. It's good to have money. It's good to be able to feed your kids. It's good to have a nice car if you want. But you don't want to put that before the true God. Right. But a lot of people today... They choose that as their God. The almighty dollar, right? That's all they want. And that is their God. 
Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to turn to a lot of scriptures today, but 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 through 10. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich, 1 Timothy 6, 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. And it goes on there. But let's go down to verse uh, 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. There you go. We're supposed to trust in God, but people are trusting in their riches rather than God, because that's become their God. But in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good and they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation. Where is true riches? Up there. You should be laying up treasures in heaven through serving Jesus. But a lot of people, all they want to do is lay down treasure out here in this world because they have made that their God. Now, I'm not saying it's sin to have money, but I'm saying it's sin to love that more than God. What did Jesus say? You cannot serve God and mammon. Those are the words of Jesus Christ. I was going to go to Mark chapter 10, verse 20 through 25, but we don't have time to turn there. Yes, ma'am. And one of, one of the commandments is thou shalt have no gods before me. Amen. One of the ten com commandments is thou shalt have no gods before me. Good point. Good point. But uh, Mark chapter 10, we don't have time to go there. Verse 20 through 25, what does it say? It's a rich man that comes to Jesus. And Jesus said, sell everything you have and give to the poor. And he went away because he had much riches and he was sorrowful. What was his problem? He cared more about money than he did about the Lord. And he literally stood before the Lord and walked away from him. He said, no, you're not going to be my God. This money is my God. Money doesn't always make you happy. Some of the most miserable people I've ever met were rich people. <laughs> Nothing wrong with being rich. You can be saved and be rich. But with riches comes sorrow. The more rich you are, the more problems you have. You ever notice that? Oh, who's going to try to steal from me today? You know, <laughs> you got more things to worry about. So the best thing to do is not put money as your God. Put God as your God and serve him. And guess what? He said he would supply your need according to his riches and grace. A lot of people, though, to them, money is their God. A lot of people, guess what their God is? Now I'm going to meddling. A lot of people, their God is sports. What is that? Well, a lot of people, it's just all about amusement. They just want to be amused. They like to watch those shows on TV and see who wins. Is that right? Well, there's nothing wrong with sports, I guess. But you shouldn't love that more than God. Amen. In the world we live in, there's some people out there, they love sports more than they love God. Go to Judges chapter 16. And while you're looking, let me tell you this. When I was in Honduras, we started a little church in Quebrada de Lajas. And we're there trying to start a church on Sunday. And guess where everybody else was? At a football game. A block up the road at the open field where they play soccer. Instead of coming to church, they wanted to go play football. That's what they call soccer in Spanish. That was their God. No, God, I'm not putting you first. Can't you play that after church? Why do you have to do it during church? That's pretty shameful, isn't it? But that's their God. That's their God. Judges chapter 16 and verse 25. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, call for Samson. Remember Samson? He was in captivity. Call for Samson out of the prison house. And he made them sport. And they set him between the pillars. They made sport out of him. They said, hey, let's use this guy for our amusement. And we'll just sit back and laugh and ha ha what he does. Like the old gladiator games and things like that. There's a lot of people out there that sports is their God. What kind of message are we sending in our country and around the world? When they pay millions of dollars to these people to go play a game, and yet people who work get next to nothing. What are they saying? That it's better to play than to work? And there's a lot of people out there that becomes their God. Man, I can make more money playing than working. Why would I want to work? Well, because you want to get honest pay, right? A lot of these guys, they get into sports and make millions of dollars, and they come out drug addicts. And they come out 
evil and wicked and, and, and end up in jail. You know how many professional football players are in jail? They got too much money too quick and it ruined them. But a lot of people will take and make sports into their God. Let's go to Proverbs 10, 23. I don't remember what it says here, but I wrote it down. So it's fun to go to verses. Amen. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 23. What does this one say? Proverbs 10, 23. It is a sport to a fool to do mischief, but a man of understanding hath wisdom. Hmm. You ever look up sport in the Bible? I think it only shows up three times. There's nothing wrong with sports. You can play volleyball. There's a volleyball court out here. You can, but don't make that your God. A lot of people do. A lot of people make that their God and this their God, and then they gamble, don't they? Oh, man, I lost. My team lost this week, man. I'm poor. That becomes your God, trying to use sports to make money through gambling. Well, we have another one here. Here's another God of today. The silver screen. Now, they don't call it this anymore, but how many remember when they called movies the, the silver screen? Why is that? Well, I think they used actually silver in the film, didn't they? And the film actually had silver in it. The silver screen, what are we talking about here? Motion pictures. There are people out there today that this is their God. And they love movies and TV, and they love it more than God. They'd rather stay home and watch TV than come to church. And that becomes their God. Now, TV can be used for good or for evil, right? I mean, you can watch me on TV. That's good. You can watch documentaries. I love documentaries. But you can also use it to look at evil things yeah. and wicked things. Would you agree there's a lot of wickedness on television? Yeah. It's hard to watch TV. If you have a TV in your house, you wouldn't want your kids watching the shows they have on there now. No. Many of the shows are so wicked, so vile. I remember in, in my day, the FCC, I think it was called, you couldn't use a cuss word on television or they'd fine you. Do you know they did away with that law? Now they can use any cuss word they want anytime they want. You want your kids to hear that? No. But some people, that becomes their God because they want to be a Hollywood star. Hey, I want to be a star, man. Uh, that becomes an idol to them. And they literally worship these people when they're fan clubs and things like that. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 23. Did they have televisions in the old day? Well, not necessarily, but they had something similar. Because what is a TV? It's an image. Yeah. One thing is it moves and changes. So in the old days, they didn't have TVs, but they had walls and they would paint images on walls. Did you know that? Let's go to Ezekiel 23, 14. You probably didn't know this, but look what it says. Ezekiel 23, 14. And that she increased her whoredoms for when she saw men portrayed upon the wall, the images of the Chaldeans portrayed with vermilion. There were some places in the Old Testament they would paint dirty pictures. And the whores would come and look at those dirty pictures. What do you think that was? Pornography. What do you think they were pictures of? You think the men were fully dressed, do you? Says she's a whore. The whore is going to look at those pictures on the wall. Do you know we have technology today where we can actually portray onto the wall yeah. images? What's the difference? I thought it was so interesting in Spanish. In Spanish, it says images in color, <laughs> in color, in color. I mean, remember when TV came out as black and white? Now in color. <laughs> oh, you want to show evil images in color now. We're back to Ezekiel. Only thing is now it changes. Back then it was just one image. Not much difference. What do people look at today? A lot of them get into pornography on the Internet yeah. or things like that. And they get eat up with it and become addicts. And that becomes their God. That's all they live for. Is that sad to you? Sad to me. It's very sad to me. Here's one. Um, well, we don't have to turn there. But in Ezekiel 21, 21. In Ezekiel 21, 21. It's a weird verse. It says, and they looked into the liver. Now, what does it mean to look into a liver? Well, the pagans, you know what pagans were, right? The lost people. And most of the lost people worship Satan. They were Luciferians. They would sacrifice animals and then pull parts out of the animals and look into them and try to do what they call divination. They would take the parts of the animal and lay it out and then tell the future by how they laid out. I don't know how that works. I had a lady one time, she says she reads tea leaves. Ooh, that's creepy. You drink tea and at the end of the thing she goes, I look at how it, it looks in the end and I can tell the future. I'm like, you're weird. <laughs> you're very weird. But it says they looked into the liver. You ever seen a liver? 
slick. Now, I don't know how that worked, but they stare at a liver until they saw something. Maybe demons in them would show them a vision on that little slippery, t it was like a little handheld screen in their hand <laughs> in which they saw a picture. Nah, we don't have that today, do we? Throw your cell phone in the garbage. No, no. Uh, but isn't that scary that they would actually look into the liver? Psalms 101 verse 3 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Amen. How about you? Job 31, 1, Job says, I made a covenant with mine eyes that I may not look upon a maid. Yet there's people out there, that's their God, and they can't wait to watch the newest movie. And who's sleeping with who this week? Hollywood is sick. Yes. When the Hollywood stars came out, they were called starlets. Why? Because he's like a harlot. And this guy and this girl were shacking up. And oh, uh, this girl got her sixth divorce and went and married this star. You remember all that? Hollywood is a cesspool of evil. But there are people that look at that, and that's their God. Are you all with me? If I'm preaching too hard, let me know. <laughs> okay, if I'm not preaching hard enough, let me know. Amen. Let's look at the next one. Well, first of all, 1 Thessalonians 5.22. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, abstain from all appearance of evil. That's what we need to do. There's a lot of evil in this. You have to be careful. Number four, sounds. Here we go with what I call music. There are a lot of people today that worship music. A lot of people today that love music. But what kind of music do they listen to? I'm going to get you in trouble, <laughs> Brother Allen, because some of the things you told me, but you worked in the music industry, didn't you? I'm going to tell a story of yours, and I might need to ask you to, to remind me something for here in a second. But the Bible says in Mark 4.24, take heed to what you hear. The devil is in the music industry. Did you know that? The Bible says that when God created Lucifer or Satan, he made him beautiful with lots of lights, but it also says he had pipes in him and he made music. And a lot of the music in the world today, this rock and roll stuff, it's of the devil. There are actually witches that pray over it before they put it out. And there's a lot of music, but people love this stuff and they worship this and it's their God. They love your heavy metal. My ears hurt when I hear stuff like that. It makes them want to bleed. But that's their God. And they love this music. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. Brother Allen used to be a bodyguard on some of these big famous musical people, correct? And he told me some stories how he saw behind the scenes the Satanism and the Luciferianism in those people. I believe the devil puts them where they are. They make a pact with Satan. And what was that story? Make sure I get this right, that you told me that, that some of these people in the music industry knew, was it not a Lester Crowley, but the other guy that took over, Anton LaVey. Anton LaVey was the head of the Church of Satan. And some of these people were part of that Church of Satan, weren't they? And they knew Anton LaVey. And someone told you when Anton LaVey died, what did he say? Tell us that story real quick. He had made a terrible mistake with his life. Something was really wrong. That was the first person witness of seeing Anton LaVey die. He said, for those that couldn't hear, he said that Anton LaVey, when he was dying, said, something's wrong here. Something is terribly wrong here. Something is wrong. I'm going to hell. Or I'm, what, how did he say it exactly? I made, a, I, made a horrible I made a horrible mistake. Yeah, I could have told you that. But he had to find out too late. And a lot of those music stars, that's their God that music. And that is sad. That is sad. Let's go to Amos chapter 6. All these things that we're seeing today is nothing new because they took place in Israel. And we see why Israel fell. Because they made these their gods. And now we're following suit. I hate to see our country going in that direction. But Amos chapter 6 and verse 1. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria. Now go down a little bit farther in verse 4 that lie upon the beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall, that chant to the sound of the viol. That's like a violin or something like that. They chant. You know, in Satanism or witchcraft, you chant something. In music, they chant. I wonder. Someone showed me this one time, and I, mm. they gave me a tape where this man was preaching about backmasking. And uh, there was a live concert of Black Sabbath, a heavy metal group. And I had this tape, and it was so good because it exposed them. 
And in a live concert, this guy just started speaking in tongues. <clears throat> he started going, lah, 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 and no one knew what he said. And it was a live concert. This guy taped it and went home and backmasked it. It was an altar call for Satan in perfect English. You think that was an accident or you think that was a demon inside of that man? But a lot of people, they make that their God. They make that music their God. And uh, I had that tape and I'd give it away for years. I gave it to a pastor to, to copy. They erased the tape. I wish I still had that tape because that was such a good tape to give to people to warn them about the dangers of this right here. Yeah, Metallica, they don't claim to be Christians. I'll tell you that right then, right? Did you ever work with Metallica? You, some of these big name people, he was their bodyguard. He said he saw things, scary things <laughs> that haunt you to this day, correct? Still haunt you. Be careful of that. Don't make that your God because that'll lead you to the false God, Satan or Lucifer. So they chant to the sound of the vial and invent to themselves instruments of music like David and drink wine in bowls. <laughs> a little cup. No, give me a big bowl. Aren't your, your rock stars like that? Bunch of drunks, bunch of drug addicts, bunch of fornicators. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I ever went to any heavy metal concerts or things like that. I, I did go to an Amy Grant concert and she kind of went away from Christian. So I guess I did go to a rock concert. If you call Amy Grant a, a rock concert. But uh, I did go one time to a Polly Shore um, comedian uh, thing at University of West Florida. And when I went to the University of West Florida, I heard that comedian. I heard Carrot Top there too. <laughs> Filthy people, filthy jokes, dirty jokes. I, I'm sorry to admit that, but that was way back then. And uh, Polly Shore said, man, this place stinks. There's not enough girls here. And he started to tell about how when he got done with his little spiel, he was going to go shack up with a couple of girls. That's the kind of people these people are. And yet people worship them as their idols and their gods. It's sick. If you know these people, you know they're all evil and wicked. Well, they drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the chief ointments, but they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. All they care about is themselves and their music and their false god. You know what they do, and I hate to even do this on camera because if I do it, somebody will try to show something. But what is the sign or the symbol that they do with their fingers, right? They put this finger up and this finger up and this one out. And that means what? In rock the rock ministry. Roll. Rock and roll. But really it's like a hail Satan, like devil horns. That's what rock and roll is. You know where the term rock and roll comes from? Rocking and a rolling in the back seat of your car. That's where the term actually comes from. Fornication. It's dirty. It's filthy. It's wicked. But that's the God of some people. It's sad. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. What kind of music are we supposed to listen to? What kind of music do we need? What does the Bible tell us we should have as our music? Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Amen. That's the kind of songs. Galatians. Amen. I put two together. Amen. Colossians 3.16. If I said Galatians, I guess I was thinking about galoshes or something that people wear when it rains. My bad. See, I'm not perfect. Just forgiven. Amen. But Colossians 3.16 says what? Spiritual songs and hymns. Another one here, let's look at this one. Spirits. You know what spirits are? In the old days, that's what they called alcohol. They called it spirits. Your malt liquor, right? Your, I don't know, alcohol. Are those good things to, to drink and take and, and do? Why were they called spirits in the old days? Did you know that? I remember as a kid seeing little bottles and it said spirit on it. And I'm like, this is weird. Why do they call uh, alcohol spirits? Because if you drink enough of it, you think you see them. Exactly. Because <laughs> if you drink enough of it, you're going to see a pink elephant, aren't you? First Peter chapter 4. And I think that that opens you up to the spirit world. Because it lets your guard down and lets you open up to things that want to get in there. And what happens when people get drunk? Bad things. When a person gets drunk, the first thing they want to do is rip their clothes off. What do you think that's going to lead to? Fornication, adultery. Also, what happens when a person gets drunk? They want to fight. And that leads to what? Assault, battery, people getting hurt, people getting... I've met people before that their eyes were missing or part of their finger was cut off. What happened? Oh, I got in a bar fight. If that's what happens in bars, I don't want to go there. 
I like to keep my, uh, just horrible things like that. I don't see how people could live a life like that, opening themselves up to spirits. What does it say in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 2 through 4? That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you. You're the bad guy when you don't want to go get drunk with them. <laughs> well, you want to go do something with spirits. No, thanks. Is it right to get drunk? Here in America, we have what's called the, the wine woman or the wine wife or something like that. Yeah. Some guy has a job, works all day while his wife stays home and drinks wine all day. She's and she's a wino. No wonder she whines when he comes home. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I shouldn't. But anyway, <laughs> but she's, she's, have you ever met a woman like that? Did you know the more you drink, the more it shows? I've known people in my life that had the brightest nose. When I was a kid, I was like, Mommy, is that Bozo the Clown? Because the more you drink, it will give you a red nose. Because it will break the blood vessels in there or something. And it, you can tell a sap drunk when you see one by a red nose. Did you ever notice that? Yeah. How many have seen that before? Be sure your sin will find you out. Amen. So a lot of people, though, that becomes their God. I told this in Spanish and you might not appreciate it, but I do. <laughs> when I went to Honduras the first time, the first two words I learned were bolo bobo. <laughs> bolo means drunk in Honduras and, and bobo means idiot. And we're driving in the car and it was me and the other missionary and another Honduran kid. And we look over there on the side of the road. This guy's going walking down the road like this, drunk as a skunk. We had the windows closed. We could still smell it on him. And the Honduran looks over and he goes, bolo bobo, like that, teaching me Spanish. A drunk fool, a drunk idiot. Sad, but who is his God? All he's thinking about is the next drink, because that's all he cared about. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 11. It's sad to see people get into that and get addicted to it. And we want to help them, but it's hard to help people that have given themselves over to addiction, isn't it? Yeah. It's only Jesus that can help them. And they need to get away from that and come to the true God. Isaiah 5:11, and Brother Mike preached this a couple weeks ago. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. Woe unto them, early in the morning. Now I'm going to say something here that I probably shouldn't say, but I'm just going to say it. This is how naive I am when it comes to this kind of stuff. Laura and I one time went to McGuire's. They have the best breakfast I think I've ever had. Five egg omelet, mmm, wonderful. And they said, you want some coffee? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, some coffee. Well, we have Irish cream coffee. I said, well, wow, I've had the, the Irish cream type of flavor. That, sure. She brought that out to us. And I went, <laughs> I thought she put battery acid in that or something. I'm like, what is this? It's 10 in the morning or 9 in the morning, whatever time. And then I realized just how, <laughs> what a true Irishman is. <laughs> he gets drunk at 10 in the morning. Does, they put alcohol in their coffee. <laughs> oh, that's against the word of God, isn't it? That's the, the opposite of what the Bible says. <laughs> wow, you got to watch out for that. So don't, don't get you an Irish cream or whatever that, what was it called? I'm not even saying it right, Irish cream. Yeah. I, I was surprised that they would serve that in the morning. In a place like that. It, it bothered me. To this day, it bothers me. No warning whatsoever, you know. I guess they think you ought to know. Well, I didn't know. <laughs> That's not what I'm interested first thing in the morning. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Yeah, amen. Now turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. Does God want us to get drunk? No. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 18, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. But a lot of people, that's their God. Rather than the Holy Spirit, they want those spirits. Do those spirits open you up to e evil demonic spirits? Yep. Sometimes I wonder. Another thing, let's look at this. Number six, smoking, watch this, marijuana. Is that good for you? No. Dude. No, I'm kind of 
Okay. It's like every other word is dude. You can tell a person who smokes marijuana because every other word is dude. <laughs> hey, dude. How you doing, dude? Dude. There's a whole drug culture in our country today. I grew up in the 80s, the war on drugs. Drugs are bad. Don't do drugs. Drugs can kill you. Drugs can harm you. Drugs are evil. Do you know they legalize this today? Yeah. That's called the gateway drug. And that drug leads to what? Others and others and others and others. And that stuff is evil and vile and wicked. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. That is not good for you. They say, oh, it doesn't harm you. Yeah, it just kills every other brain cell. And all you can do is just say, dude, a bunch. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 says, be sober. Are you sober when you're high all the time? No. No. Be sober. Be vigilant. Are you vigilant when you're smoking marijuana? You're like, dude. <laughs> Have you ever noticed people that do that? And yet our government says, no, that's good. They're even helping people. They've legalized it. Now they're legalizing, and I'm going to say this wrong because I don't know much about it. Fentanyl, is that what it's called? Yeah. Fentanyl. That is like ice type stuff. Is it like crack on ice? Synthetic morphine. I don't know much, but if you take too much morphine, it'll kill you, yeah. right? And yet they're selling this stuff, and, and the government's even helping in, in places like Washington State and Seattle, they, giving it away instead of making it illegal because it can kill people. And everybody that goes that route and gets into that stuff, they started with this right here. That becomes their God. Now it's a, a whole culture in our country. It's so sad that people get into that. But it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 23, it uses the term sorcery, or the sorceries. And I don't like to run to the Greek, but you know what? All over, everybody points this out, so it's, it's a known fact. That word in the Greek language is pharmakia. That's where we get our word pharmacy, our pharmaceuticals. It's drugs. Sorceries. So think about that. What's sorcery? When I think of sorcery, I think of wizards and witches and witchcraft. Well, the ancient pagans that were witches and witchcrafts and the druids, they used drugs as their entrance into the spirit world to commune with evil spirits. Is that something that we should do? Is that something we should get into? No. I, I don't think so. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 18. But that becomes your God, and that's all you live for. That's the direction you're headed. You're headed straight for the devil and his world. And you're opening yourself up to Satan when you get into that stuff. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9 through 12. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abomination of those nations. Amen. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. That's all entrance into the spirit world. You're opening yourself up to demonic oppression and spiritual evil when you go down that road. And most likely, it'll take you to something else, and it'll kill you. One of my best friends when I was a kid was a friend of mine. And when we got older, we'd go surfing together. And he claimed to be a Christian, but he wasn't. He'd go to church, but I saw him get away. I saw him starting to listen to the bad music, watching the bad movies. And then he moved down to South Florida. He was 38 years old. He started with marijuana. Then he started getting into shrooms. Then he started getting into this and acid and other things, which I don't know anything about. All I know is a little something you put on your tongue or something. Then he got into heroin. 38 years old and his hair was white as it could be. And they found him in his bedroom dead with a needle in his arm. D -D. Didn't even make it to 40. That's so sad to me that one of my best friends, and I wanted to be saved, I witnessed to him all the time, that took his life. That became his God. That's all he cared about. And I went to the funeral. I looked in the casket and I cried. And his mother came and gave me a big hug. And she asked me this question. Why was my son such a hellion? 
What a thing to say about your own son. He's a hellion because he chose the way of evil rather than the way of God. He sure had a chance, but he went the wrong way. A lot of people have another God. This is their God, sex. And their God is all about men's perversion. Perver, I can spell this here, perversion. They're perverted in their mind. It's not enough for them to get married and enjoy the union of man and wife, as the Bible says. No, they got to have many different women or men. And then they go down that road of evil. Sorry? And, and some has got to have it with the same... Sex, yeah. With the same sex. Yep. Or even both. There you go. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 14. Sorry, they, they go down this wrong path of fornication and adultery. And then, oh, that's not enough for me. I got to try something different. Then they go down the path of sodomy. Oh, that's not enough for me. I got to try something different. They get into S&M. You know what that is? Sadism and masochism. That's you doing something <laughs> sinful, but then you're beating each other as you do it, whipping one another. It's pain. Oh, that's not enough. What's the next step? Bestiality. Do you know in the Bible when it talks about homosexuality, the very next verse is bestiality. It says not to do it. You're that far away from bestiality when you go into sodomy. And they become perverted. Now they want to have sex with children. This is all leading to sexual perversion. And when that becomes your God, you'll keep going down that path. I knew a guy one time and he told me, he said, man, I used to have a problem with pornography. And he confessed to me that he looked at pornography on the internet he says, but I don't anymore. And I don't know, I think he's a Sunday school teacher now. I think he's just, he confessed to me in private. You know, I'm not a Catholic priest, so I can tell, amen. But uh, and he told me that, that he had that problem at one time, but not anymore. I said, well, what, what, what led to you not? He says, I was clicking, and it just says, just click here, just click here, just click here. He said, I just kept clicking. And then he says, and then I saw it say, just click here to see women with animals. And he said, I decided to not click anymore, and I went in the bathroom and threw up, and I came back and turned the computer off. <laughs> he said, I was that far away from going to a place I didn't want to be and seeing something I didn't want to see. And thank God he got the victory over it. But Some of you in here, have you got the victory over it? Sin is like a tumbleweed. It just keeps going. It's like a rock on a hill keeps going down. It's hard to go back the other way. You start on a way of sin, you're going to end up in deeper sin. It's going to be bad. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. God will judge you if you do that. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20 says to flee fornication. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says the will of God is to not fornicate. But yet we live in a world full of fornicators. And they're heading down the way in the path of destruction. Here's another one. I only have like 10 of them. No, no. I've got, yeah, I've got 10 of them. That was supposed to be a joke, but that's how many I got. I'll, I'll go quickly, okay? I've only got about 10 of them. Here's one. Science. And they all happen to start with an S. Isn't that cool? Science. A lot of people today, that's their God. Science. They want to follow men's wisdom rather than God's wisdom. Right? So they're all like, man, to me, it's all about science. Science, science, science. Oh, the Bible, pfft, that's a lie. Don't listen to that. I'm an evolutionist. And they believe in evolution. How can anyone believe in evolution? It says nothing blow up. And when it blew up, that's how we got into existence. And by the way, you, you know, you come from a monkey. I mean, that's just, to me, that just sounds silly. And they say there's no God creator. But yet science goes and looks at the DNA and it's a code proving that there was an intelligent design. I don't understand how people can follow science. But many today would rather follow science than the Bible. And we've seen this, what, the last couple of years, haven't we? With this man in the White House, the self-proclaimed defender of your health, Mr. Fauci. How many of you know this man named Fauci? Is it Fauci or Fauci? Or Fauci? Fauci. Fauci? Fauci? Faux means fake. Fauci, I think I call him Fauci. I've heard it different ways. You know, people call him Lord Fauci. 
We're talking about making gods. Doesn't that sound like making him into a god, Lord Fauci? They put a little saint's candle of him and things like that. No, it's the Lord Jesus Christ, not Lord Fauci. Amen. And I don't understand how anyone could follow a man. The Bible warns us about science. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, and verse 20, and let me read that to you. Before I do, that guy Fauci bothers me. Amen. You know what he said? He said, follow the science. It's all about the science. And then he says, and I'm a scientist. So what's he doing? He's puffing himself up and saying, follow me. Okay, well, let's look at you and what you said. When the whole COVID thing came out, he said, you don't have to wear a mask. It doesn't work. Why? Because that fabric can allow a virus to go through. A virus is so small that it can go through that mask. It's the equivalent of, of a ball bearing going through a chain link fence. That's how small a virus is. And so when it started and it came out, he said, you don't have to wear a mask. They don't work. A couple months later, he comes out, no, no, you got to wear a mask. They work. That science <laughs> says one thing and then says the opposite. If it stopped there, we'd be like, man, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But it didn't stop yeah, there, did it? sounds more like contradiction to me. Exactly, contradiction. A couple months later, he goes, well, a mask doesn't work, so you need to have two of them or three of them. <laughs> That's what you call science? It doesn't work, don't wear it. No, it works, wear it. No, it doesn't work, wear two or three of them. <laughs> Who in their right mind would follow a man like that? I can't. I think that guy doesn't know his head from his butt. I'll be honest with you, I don't want to be mean. I hope that didn't come across as unchristian, but I would never follow a person like that, would you? No. If you do, you'll smother. If you do wear that many, it's, you're smothering yourself. And that's science, because oh, I can't breathe, right? <laughs> Science is provable fact that you can prove by observation. And I observe that wearing two or three of them, I observe that I can't breathe. <laughs> so scientifically, I can't do it. All right? How about you? Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20. Does the Bible tell us to follow science? Well, when science doesn't line up with the Bible, we have to choose the Bible. In 1 Timothy 6, 20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. All right, I've got to hurry. Let me get to the more here. Other people out there, they'll take sinners and make sinners into their gods. They want to make men into gods. Kind of like your Hollywood stars. They want to make them into idols. Go with me real quick to Acts chapter 14 and verse 11. I'll be done here real quickly. Acts 14, 11. Look at this. The pagans always worship men as gods. The Caesar stood up and said, I'm a God. Worship me as God. Well, Acts chapter 14, verse 11, here comes Paul, and he's doing miracles and stuff. And look what it says in Acts 14, 11. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of the Lyconian, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. They said, hey, let's worship these guys as gods. And who was with them? If I'm not mistaken, was it Barnabas or someone else was with Paul there? And they just went, gods in the flesh! And they wanted to worship those men as though they were gods. When Jesus Christ, God, was manifest in the flesh, and they won't worship him. Does that make sense to you? They want to make men into gods and worship men. Over in Hollywood, have you ever looked at Hollywood? Holly, that actually comes from holy, and then wood. Wood. Do you know where the pagans used to worship? In the woods, in the groves, and they would worship their false gods idols. Hollywood. Where is Hollywood in America? California. It's in Los Angeles in California, correct. Los Angeles. Do you know what Los Angeles is in English? The angels. <laughs> oh boy. Did you know the Bible says that the fallen angels, they call themselves gods? I wonder if out in Los Angeles there aren't a bunch of demons and fallen angels. Wow. No wonder they want to turn people into gods. Then, then you got this guy, this guy here, Obama, <laughs> or Obama. Uh, uh, isn't he Irish? Doesn't he come from Chicago or something? So I think I should put one of those there, Obama, because they always O'Reilly or O something. So, yeah. oh, but anyway, Obama, when he was president, they worshiped that man like he was a god. I don't understand that. I actually saw things where people would come to him, and you know what they called him? They said he is the goat, G-O-A-T. That's what they called him. Now people say, well, goat, that stands for greatest, greatest 
of all time. But it can also mean God of all things. G-O-A-T. And people worship that man as though he was God. I don't know why. What are they talking about today? Today, what is the big push? Transhumanism. Have you ever heard of transhumanism? No. Here's how it works. Of course, there's a lot of people talk about just trans. But many of your higher elites and, and uppity ups and muckety mucks, whatever they're called, the rich people in the world that try to rule things, the elites, they say, we believe in transhumanism. And they have a plan to live forever and to be as gods. I think I heard that somewhere before. Wasn't that Genesis 3, 5? The lie of the devil, you shall be as gods? Yeah, that's where that comes from. But transhumanism is this. They want to take their brains, where all their memories are and everything they know, download it into a computer. And then put themselves in the metaverse or some, some sort of computerized world and live forever in that. If that's not the dumbest thing I've ever heard, I don't know what is. First of all, you're going to die someday anyway, and your soul's going to go down to hell or up to heaven, depending whether you're saved or not. But they think, no, there's no soul, and we'll just live on forever in a computer. Okay, what are you going to do when the power goes out? <laughs> That's the end of you, right? <laughs> I mean, do they even think? Can anyone be that dumb? They say, well, we thought about that. We built huge underground computers under, under the ground. Oh, yeah, okay, so when the lava comes, it's going to burn them, right? No, no, we have huge underground, you know, uh, cold things. To, um, listen, silly. What are you going to do when the solar pulse comes from the sun and burns it? I mean, it can go down. They don't think they thought this out too well, did they? All you have to do is turn off the power, and that's the end of them. Transhumanism. So they say we are going to become gods. Well, the final one here is this. Guess who ultimately they want to make their own God? Their self. Today, it's all about me, 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 me. And people today, they don't care about others, only about themselves. There was a woman one time named Shirley MacLaine. She's very heavy in what's called the New Age. Guess what she said? I am God. And she went around and told everyone, say, I am God, I am God. That's transhumanism, that is becoming gods. Are men gods? No. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 22. Can we as men be gods? No. Only God is God, but nowadays the lie is you can be a God. That's so sad. Isaiah 45 and verse 22. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. God says. Amen. So let's close with Joshua chapter 24. Go to Joshua chapter 24. And I started this thing with Israel. And Israel left the promised land. And as soon as they were delivered and got out, the first thing they did was turn away from God to false gods. What were they thinking? And here are some of the things that we today look at as false gods. What were they thinking? Well, they spent 40 years in the wilderness, and then finally Joshua leads them into the promised land, and they're conquering, and they're taking over the land. They're putting God first. And Joshua says, now, if you want God to bless you, this is what you need to do. Joshua 24, 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood. And in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Amen. Whether the gods which were your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood are the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Verse 16, And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Now skip down to verse 23. Now therefore put away, said he, Joshua, the strange gods which are among you, <laughs> and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. Amen. Do you have any of these? Are these some things that you have in your heart that you care more about than God, than coming to church, than other Christians? Do you have these other gods? Tonight is your opportunity 
to do just that. Put them away. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads, please. If a piano player could come, please, and, and play a little piano for us real quick. I just want to give you an opportunity. If God's laid something on your heart tonight or pricked your heart, maybe, or spoke to you about something in your life that you need to get rid of, would you come down here to the altar and pray? Maybe uh, you need to get this thing right with the Lord. Oh, you might say, well, it's not my God, but I, I really do like that. Or maybe I'm, I'm guilty of that. Why don't you make up your mind? Lord, today I choose to put it away. Is there anybody in here tonight like that that might need to come down here and just spend a little time in prayer? We're in no hurry tonight. Has the Lord laid it on your heart? Listen, you're heading down the wrong direction if you're in some of this. You might say, well, my foot's just in the door. I'm not in it wholeheartedly. Yeah, but guess who's on the other side waiting to pull you through into sin and wickedness and evil? I'd sure hate to see some of these young kids a year from now. We have the funeral here for them because they got into drugs and died overdosing. Anybody need to come tonight and speak to the Lord and tell them, Lord, there's something in my heart that I need to get rid of? Tonight's a good night for that. Do you have a false God? Are you good? Oh, I'm good, Brother Breaker. Yet you're going to go home tonight and watch a dirty movie? Oh, I'm, I'm fine, Brother Breaker. And you're going to go home and listen to your evil rock music. Go right back to the same world you came out of. Are you the same in church as you are outside of church? Are you really a godly, good Christian that just does right all the time? Or do you need to get right? I'm giving you a chance tonight. It's up to you to decide. I'm not going to tarry long if nobody wants to come. But let me ask you this. Do you even know God? Are you saved? Do you have Jesus as your Savior? If not, tonight's the night. Please see me after service. Talk with me. I want to show you in the Bible how you can know you're saved. So you can be a way, way far away from all these things. And you can be with the Lord. And on your way to heaven. All right, we'll stop there. Go ahead and let's pray. You can stop playing, please. Let's pray and then we'll go home. Thank you for listening tonight. I hope this has been a blessing to you. Lord God, I just thank you for the opportunity to preach this tonight and to present this. And I thank you, Lord, that I finally got to say it in English. I hope it goes out all around the world. I hope some people will get right. And maybe in their home or in their car somewhere, we'll, we'll make a little altar there and get right with you, God. Lord, I thank you for your mercy, for your grace, for loving us. And Lord, we just pray that you come soon. But until you do, Lord, we pray for our nation that they would turn back to you, God, because they've gone astray to many of these false gods. And Lord, we just want our nation to get back to what it once was. We pray for our nation. We pray, Lord, that you'd come soon in Jesus' name. Amen.